morning everyone and welcome to Cedardale. We're so pleased to have you with us. This is a good place to be to start off the new year and uh, we're just excited to see what God's going to do in the year ahead. And I'd just like to read you a blessing out of the scriptures and it's found in the second last book of the Bible in Jude and it's verses 24 and 25. And it says here, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forevermore. Amen. So God bless you for this new year. And now we're going to hear the message that Pastor Grant has for us. It's the conclusion of his um, series that he's been talking about. So let's hear Pastor Grant. Good morning. Happy New Year. Those words are wonderful. As we enter and engage a new year, ahead of us many of us have maybe made some resolutions and some of us maybe haven't maybe some of us have made the resolution to use last year's resolution <laughs> but anyway happy new years before i begin my thought on our wonderful text today i just want to say a brief word about these thoughts that i have now Last year was an interesting year, a difficult year. In the words of Charles Dickens, you could say that it was the best of times and the worst of times all rolled into one year. But one thing that has not changed, and one thing that will not change, is our glorious Savior is always glorious. In every time and every epoch and every season and out of season, He's always good. His mercy endures forever. I have thought over the past week, the uh, blessings, opportunities, the wonderful things that God has done over this past year. He has blessed our community dinners. He has blessed us with a pancake breakfast that had many from this community come out and many people I had not seen before. There was opportunities in salvation as many people have come to Christ this year. And it's been marvelous to see how God is using them and progressing in their life. We have seen people that have come forward for membership here at this church. And even today, the start of the new year, a young man has expressed a desire to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is happening today at Cereal Church. God is good, and he's always good all the time. And so we've seen his a wonderful hand of mercy in lives. We've seen Bibles handed out. We've seen 300 or more come to the walk to Bethlehem over the two nights. We've seen marvelous provision of foodstuffs that God has provided that I could help to other community agencies in the area. He provided with toys, uh, or this church could provide for help for the Puffalo Lionesses and other agencies. God is just so good. And so I want you and your family to take a day like today on this New Year's Day and go back over the year and recount the blessings of God. The times with family, the times with friends, the times that you've had in the community, maybe at the bank, encouraging a teller, maybe at Sobeys where you've encouraged the cashier. Those have been opportunities of God's grace. Good opportunities, marvelous opportunities that only God could put together. Then there's the VBS. And then there's the other things that have gone on in this church, the Mums and Tots group and, and the marvelous opportunities that we've had for uh, evangelism, for encouragement, for support, for resources that we were able to give and help those in the community. Then there's the mental and emotional side of things where we've been the last resort for many, many people. Our counseling opportunities here at this church have been wonderful over this past year. The doors of this church are really never shut. If they make an appointment, there's always someone available to talk to them here. This is marvelous what God is doing. We, we want to put God on our timetable. 
And we want to schedule him for the things that we want to see happen. But if we just stand back and allow God to do what he's going to do and pray in Jesus' name, believing that he can do these things because he can do the impossible, you will see them. You will see them. If you are a wonderful uh, person in the community that's out there giving and supplying people with hope, faith, and love, you will see the reciprocal re effects. You will see the bounty that God has in store for you to see. There's opportunity at the hospital. There's been opportunity everywhere I've gone this past year. I celebrate God's goodness in the land of the living every single day. And then I want to encourage you as well as we go through the new year. We talk a lot about prayer. Why not put the chutzpah in it? Why not put your rumpus umpus into prayer and make that a real big part of your life this year, seeing and seeking out what God wants to do? God's way is still his way. He encourages, he lifts up the forlorn, he brings that opportunity to us, maybe at the last minute of when we're thinking about, but he is always there. He's always guiding, he's always delivering. He is always uh, asking us to come unto him. And Isaiah says, come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And so I also encourage some of you, maybe this is the time to take some rest as well. Take some rest for yourself, for your soul, for your mind, for your heart. Read a good book. Read a classic. Read something that's going to refresh you. Maybe for others, is take a media holiday. Take a holiday from the media and the blitz that goes on there. And put yourself into the mind of William Carey or, or John Stott or one of the missionaries in the past. Read or reread Pilgrim's Progress. Read or reread the Confessions by St. Augustine. Read something that's so crunchy and so good that it will stir your soul as we enter into this new year. Well, those are my thoughts for the new year. Those are my thoughts. Prayer, faith, hope, love are still available. They're still there. And they're still worthy of a new year. I hope and pray as we enter into this, engage this new year, because it's a battleground, my friends. It's a battleground for every Christian on this planet. Things are happening beyond our control, but not beyond God's control. So study, learn, seek him. And as we've talked about in our Christmas messages, wise men and wise men, women still seek him. Seek him this year with all your heart and follow his will because it's always good. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Well, God bless you as you engage this new year. May it be full of hope and love and mercy and compassion and empathy as we seek all of us here at Citadel to make known a loving Christ. That is our mission. And that will never change because I believe that Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. We ask, Lord, that you would stir us, revive us. Maybe today is a day where we just reflect on where you've been with us over this past year. Maybe it's a time to reflect on our prayer life. Maybe it's a time to reflect on our heart condition. Where is my heart? Where is my heart in, con in consideration of eternity and the value of Christ in my life? Maybe it's time to just pause and unplug from all the, de the devices we're so connected with. Maybe it's time to, to just rest. Maybe it's time to, to read a wonderful book stir us. Maybe it's time to reread the book of Daniel and to see how a man's prayer life actually altered history. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you that, that you're able to do these things. And so we give you the praise. We want to commit this year to you. I want to commit and refresh myself as I look forward to this new year. I want to re-give myself to you and, and ask that you would re, uh, reignite me, re-establish those old ancient boundaries in my life that I might be uh, a wonderful, uh, useful tool in your hand, that wherever you want me, wherever you desire I should go, that you would be with me and guiding me in every opportunity that you bring in my path. May that be for all of us. May that be for all of us, that wherever we are, we'd be useful in your hand because we're ready and equipped for the things that you have for us. So we ask these things in your wonderful name, because it's a wonderful name 
because you're the wonderful counselor and the Prince of Peace. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of today's message is The Greatest Savior. And today is message number seven. Our text is Isaiah 63, verse 1. But you should read Isaiah 63, 1 to 6, when you get a minute. Zephaniah 3, 17 says, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Hebrews 7, 25 says, Therefore He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. And Isaiah 53, 12, and we've used this in our previous messages, but it's still timeless and wonderful to use. Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide with the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Oh, our Savior is a marvelous topic. And in fact, friends, it could encompass the entire year. It could encompass 52 Sundays of teaching on this one topic alone. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save, it says in our text. Jesus, our gracious Redeemer and mighty Savior, is our magnificent topic today. The wonder of his person, the marvelous character, who is traveling in the greatness of his strength, who says himself he is mighty to save, for he is the King of righteousness, the King of the ages, and the King of heaven, all rolled into one person. He participated with his Heavenly Father in all acts of his divine might, he was there in the decree of election and upholding and fashioning of the wonderful covenant and the creation of the holy angels and then the making of the world and making of the cosmos and then the making of galaxies beyond number being fashioned from nothing with words such as this let there be and there was before any of these acts the divine redeemer was the eternal son the wonderful counselor and mighty God. The Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. And that's recorded in the Nicene Creed. From everlasting to everlasting, Psalm 90, it says, He is God, nor did he cease to be God when he became a man for our sakes. He was and is equally God over all, blessed forever. Romans 9, 5. For he is eternally steadfast, and he's always imperially powerful. As Isaiah 61 says, he was equally God when he was the man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief in Isaiah 53, 12 or 3. The Spirit of God was upon him as he traveled in, in the greatness of the strength, traveling as the anointed one in the raising of the dead, walking on the waves, the hushing of the winds, preaching good tidings to the poor, comforting and healing the brokenhearted, proclaiming liberty to the captives, breaking open the doors of the locked prisons, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, comforting those who mourn, supplying a crown of beauty in exchange for horrible ashes, and giving festive praise instead of a spirit of despair. With all those marvelous acts which he performed were strong and potent proofs that he was God, most truly God, and he is God now. And he shares the throne with his heavenly father, Hebrews 4.12. And he is high above every principality and power in every name that is named, that can be named or will be named. 
Forever and ever and ever, he will be gloriously great. Yes, brethren, he's God's son and the sinner's savior. He's the fisherman's companion and the mighty carpenter who built the world. He is the mighty God, the mediator, the son of God and the son of man. He is the glorious one of whom our text speaks when it says he is mighty, mighty to save. These are not comments to tickle the imagination. He is, history will attest and record, the most captivating person who has ever lived and crossed the horizon of this world. Jesus not only claimed the amazing, friends, he did the amazing because he is amazing and wonderful beyond our comprehension. He had no predecessor and he will have no successor. No one can deny his sovereign and holy influence over nature over sickness, over death, over demons, and even over the world. He supplies strength for the weak, and he's available for the tempted and the tried. Jesus Christ should be our object of utmost love, and he should be the object of our highest praise always, forever and ever. A mighty Savior. Warren Wearsby had a good word on prophecies like this one in Isaiah 63. He said, whenever a prophet foretold the future, it was to awaken the people to their responsibilities in the present. Bible prophecy isn't entertainment for the curious, he said. It's encouragement for the serious. The book of Isaiah derives its title from the author, whose name means the Lord is salvation, and is similar to the names Joshua, Elisha, and Jesus. Isaiah is quoted directly in the New Testament over 65 times, more than any other Old Testament prophet, and mentioned by name over 20 times. Isaiah prophesied during the period of the divided kingdom, directing the major thrust of his message to the southern kingdom of Judah. He condemned the empty ritualism of his day and the idolatry into which so many of the people had fallen into. And you could look up that in chapter 1 and chapter 48. He foresaw the coming Babylon captivity or invasion, yes, of Judah because of their departure from the Lord of glory. The key word there is their departure from the Lord of glory. One truth we can learn from Isaiah 63 is that it should stir a spirit of sustained hope, realizing that true biblical hope is not a hope so, but a hope sure. In certainty, and in truthfulness, a holy confidence in times of despair. The event, yes, described in the conversation between a finite mortal and the majestic Messiah is a grand truth that is given to saints of all ages in a world becoming more and more fractured, and frustrated, and more unraveling, that we might have hope, a vital hope, and the wonderful assurance that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit know the plans that they have for us, plans to give us a hope and a wonderful future, it is a real certainty as it was in the time of Jeremiah. Friend, you may be today in the sloth of despond like J John Bunyan's Pilgrim in Pilgrim's Progress, and yet the Spirit-inspired truths such as those found in Isaiah 63 are calculated to lift your head toward the clouds in the eastern sky, like the prophet Daniel of old, where one day our glorious Redeemer will come with a great shout and great blast of the trump of the archangel. And he is the majestic one who Paul says is our hope in 1 Timothy 1.1. Promised even before the world began, even before Adam and Eve plunged the world into horrible sin, Yes, friends, what a mighty God we serve. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save, it says in verse 1. With awe, the watchmen of Judah gaze across the borders and see a mighty figure traveling across the wilderness, clothed in glorious and wonderful clothing, marching in great strength. He comes from Edom, Jacob's brother's tribe, and from Basra, 
a city in Edom, wearing garments which appear to be dyed red. But why? And who is he? What is happening here? Well, the name Basra means vintage, a suitable name for the whole passage, for it is the picture of the treading of the wine press. Basra was on the heights, guarding the king's high highway, and was probably concerned in the refusal to allow Israel to pass in the time of Moses. Edom had betrayed his brother. We need to see the book of Obadiah. You can look at that in chapter 1, verses 8 to 14. I'm going to just give you one verse out of it, though, verse 10. For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. And that's what the prophet Obadiah says. In our text, the reply comes back, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. This is significant for the whole meaning of the passage. Friends, it's all about righteousness. It's all about salvation. For Edom, mercy had ceased to be an option. Their hearts had been constantly hardened, even though the Lord had dealt righteously with Edom. For he is the righteous one. He comes to offer deliverance to his people. The question comes, why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the grapes in a wine press? The watchers have now spotted that his clothing is not just dyed, but it is stained. It is stained blood red like someone who has been treading in a wine press. Verse 3 says, I have trodden the wine press alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. The reply comes that it is because he will have been treading the winepress and treading it all alone. It will not be an ordinary winepress, though. It will be the winepress of God's anger, of God's supreme aversion to sin. And the trodden grapes will be guilty people who have rejected him and clung to their sin. There will be no one to assist him, for all will be equally guilty. and There will be no one fit to even help him. He will tread the wine press alone. That is why his clothing will be stained. It will be because it is covered with the lifeblood of the guilty. For Edom, it will have been the day of vengeance, a foretaste of the final day of vengeance. And you should see chapter 34. But his purpose is that it should also be the year of his redeemed. For those who would hear, the time has come. He is coming out of Edom not to do the same to Jacob or Israel, but in order to redeem. The year of his redeemed ones has come. The picture is twofold. It is a picture of Edom's coming doom and of God's wonderful offer of mercy to his people. His people must take heed to the warning though and repent because it is also an apocalyptic one. Is a picture of God's offer to a lax and careless world. They too must decide between God's covenant or receive judgment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of the redeemed has come, Isaiah 63, 4 says. We can compare this with the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of God, as found in Isaiah 61, verse 2. Did you know that on the ninth of Av, both destructions of the temple were on the same day? in 586 BC and in 70 AD. The anointed one and the bloodstained one are one and the same, and he is involved in both these scenarios. The year of my redeemed confirms that we are dealing with the redeemer as well as the judge of all the earth, Isaiah 59. You see, Israel and Edom were constant foes. And this was the more remarkable because their ancestors were brothers. But from the earliest time, there was strife between these two boys. And the antagonism from the cradle was perpetrated right through the history of these great nations, which owed their existence to Jacob and Esau. When Israel pleaded for permission, you see, to pass through the land of Edom and reduce their much heavy, weary march, Edom refused and came out against them with much people in a strong hand which was an affront which was never forgotten. It was a grim satisfaction, therefore, to Israel when the whole band of Edom was temporarily subdued under King David. But the subjection could not be maintained. And through the troubled reigns of the kings, we find Edomites always giving trouble, 
siding with Israel's foes and taking every opportunity to pillage and plunder and harm and mayhem and cause confusion everywhere they went. When Nebuchadnezzar made the final assault against the holy city, it was the children of Edom that said, raise it, raise it to the ground. In Psalm 137, 7. In other words, burn it. Burn it to the ground. Christ is mighty to save, which is my one big point today. It is the only point, really, that I've considered and put together because of the power of Christ's blood. Um, oh, the atonement of Christ through the blood and merits of Jesus our Lord. Peter declares, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In our text, the prophet sees the, a glorious person coming from the enemy's camp, coming from Basra, which is to the southeast of Israel. He travels in the greatness of his strength. Thrilled at the sight, the prophet says, Who is this? And this approaching conqueror answers, I that speak in righteousness am mighty to save. Verse 3 and verse 6 reveal his victory. He has trodden down the nations. He was victorious over hostile powers. And he has done it with his own strength and might. And he has conquered alone. Edom was the land originally inhabited by Jacob's older twin brother Esau. Recall that Jacob means heel catcher or supplanter or trickster. He tricked his father Isaac into bestowing the blessing on him rather than on Esau, who was the rightful heir by birth order. Jacob's trickery led to a lifelong hostility between these two boys. And so when Israel, Jacob, had been released from Egyptian bondage and was seeking safe passage through Edom, the king of Edom would not allow it. Instead, he attacked Israel. Later, the Edomites opposed King Saul fought against King David, opposed King Solomon, and opposed King Jehoshaphat, and they even rebelled against Jehoram. <sighs> the lesson for us today is this. Jesus died in the likeness of sinful flesh. The tearing of the veil and the tearing of the flesh of the cross of Calvary teach the same lesson. Jesus overcame, and he uttered his dying cry of victory on Calvary's cross, and his marvelous resurrection. He came up from Edom, the Edom of our foes, radiant with victory, though stained with the blood juice of the battle. Whatever the flesh means to us, with its passion and pride and self-assertion, with its stubborn, gnarly will, with its restless yearning for gratification and license, all has been met, vanquished, and forever trodden underfoot by him who is mighty to save and who travels in the greatness of his strength. We need not fear the flesh if we abide in Jesus. If we abide in him, as John 15, 5 says, we share his victory. It is ours because we are one with him. Let us meditate then on this wonderful fact until it has become part of the very fabric of our heart, soul, and mind. Billy Graham once said, the cross presents itself in the midst of our dilemmas as our only hope. Here we find the justice of God in perfect satisfaction. The mercy of God extended to the sinner and the love of God covering every need. The power of God for every emergency and the glory of God for every occasion. Here is enough power, he said, to change the world. Oh, the victory of Calvary. For the Bible says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. Whenever the Edom of the flesh asserts itself, fall back, friends, fall back on the victory of the cross where Christ laid down his life and gave himself to the pounding nail and the piercing spear. Identify yourself with that victory and believe that the living Savior comes from your Edom, leaving it a defeated kingdom, for he is mighty to save you to the uttermost. Flee to him then. Flee to him for salvation and shelter. Flee to him even today. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves dead to sin and be alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. R Romans 6.11 Our flesh may chaff for its old supremacy, but remember the only way in which Satan can succeed in bringing us again beneath the power of the flesh is either by hiding from us 
what Christ has done or by leading us to look away from it. Oh, friends, are you acquainted with the story of sin? Are you acquainted with Adam and Eve who disobeyed a generous and loving God in the beginning of human history in the Garden of Eden and crashed all humanity? When sin came, it brought tears, pain, heartache, sorrows, and suffering. And that has been the experience of mankind ever since, even to this very day in 2023. Jesus came to conquer our sin problem. He is the conqueror of sin's dominion. He became the Lamb of God and mighty Savior. He was the only one who is mighty to save. The apostle wrote, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. But the free gift is not like the offense, he says. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, and the gift of the grace of one man. Jesus Christ abounded to many. And that many is you and I. Yes, friends. Paul also said of our glorious conqueror, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He took my guilt and carried it to the old rugged cross, to Calvary. He died to break sin's dominion. He rose again on the third day. We are provided freedom from sin, and a holy God had received an acceptable sacrifice in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. Jesus' earthly pilgrimage and sojourn was for this purpose. They sang a new song in heaven saying, You, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, says Revelation 5.9. Friends, Jesus saved the rich, the righteous, the rotten and the rebellious. Yes, he died for all men and all women. All kinds, all classes, all conditions, all creeds. And he can save, for he is mighty to save. And he's willing to save. Jesus paid the ultimate price. Jesus redeemed you with his precious blood. And now the great receipt is nailed to Calvary's cross. It is finished. It is finished. Yes, he's the conqueror of sin's dominion. So that we may go free by believing in him. Isn't that marvelous, friends? He gave his crown, his throne, his joys his in heaven for us that we might have life and have it more abundantly because he is mighty to save. Isaiah 45 says, Look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Friends, it doesn't say look to the traditions and candles. It doesn't say look to the rituals or practices, customs or conducts. But it says with authority, look unto me. For there is none like him. By the words to save, you can understand this. The whole great work of salvation. From the first holy desire to the first spiritual conviction. Onward to complete sanctification. All this is done of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ is not only mighty to save to those who do repent. But he is mighty to give men and women new hearts. And a work of mighty faith in them. He is not mighty merely to give some heaven to those who wish for it, but he is mighty to make men and women who hate holiness love it, to constrain the despiser of his holy name to bend their knee before his holy name. Friends, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. He can, as history can attest over and over and over again, make the most vile person turn from their error and their evil of their ways to a righteous and holy God. Friends, Jesus came into the world not to put men and women into a savable state, but into a saved state. Amen? Friends, you can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. For he says himself in Isaiah 43, I, even I am he who blots out transgressions for my sake, and I will not remember your sins. In conclusion, Thomas Watson once said, Bless God, all you as saints, that he has removed your spiritual cataract and has enabled you to discern those things which by nature's spectacles you could never see. Look to Jesus who covered you with his blood. 
It is by the blood of the Lamb that I stand in the gap on the words of the prophet Isaiah, believing Christ's power to save. We are troubled, but we are not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are cast down, but we're not destroyed. As the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, it is by the grace of Christ Jesus that my belief drives me to trust him more and more and more. It is by the grace of Christ that my belief sees wonders only he can do every day, every day, every day. It is by the grace of Christ that my belief convicts me in my heart to sense God's love and lavish desire. I did right to love the Lord God with all my heart, soul, and mind and love my neighbor as myself. Yes, yes, friend, salvation not just from the penalty of sin, but salvation from the power of sin. Friends, it's just Jesus that you need. Look to him only. This is the challenge for this year. This is the mighty challenge for this whole year. Look to Christ. Look to Jesus now. Look to him only. Oh, he is the anchor of hope. To the lonely and oppressed, he is the balm of Gilead. To the world adrift in moral and spiritual chaos, he is the composer of salvation. He's the author and finisher of our most holy faith. And he's the heavenly lawyer, our holy advocate with the Father, because he has done it. And we need no other. We absolutely need no other. His invitation is still available. Do you know what F.B. Meyer said? The one thing that hinders God is our unbelief. Did you catch that, friend? The one thing that hinders God is our unbelief. So look to Jesus, for he is mighty to save. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Someone has said, it is our faith, even in our distress, even when memories are past and gone, even when the world rolls back on its dismal place and all that radiance lies forlorn, even when it seems as if it's always winter. This Messiah, this Savior, this wonderful one lifts up, carries us all the days of our lives forever and ever. Amen. Friends, as we engage this new year today, throughout this year, Trust Christ. Trust him. Trust him with your life. It's the best decision you will ever make. And Happy New Year. May God bless you this year. And may God's face shine upon you in a wonderful love and way that only he can. God bless you and your family. And Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your mighty one. The one who comes traveling in the greatness of the strength. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that he was the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father and prince of peace. We thank you that he is, shall be great because that was where it started, right in the before the cradle. He shall be great. He, his name will be called Emmanuel. Father, we thank you that you're God with us. We ask that you would guide us. We ask that you direct us. We ask that you would motivate us. We ask that you would, you would instill in our hearts a holy desire, a holy flame, a holy revival. Bring this revival to the world, Father, for we need it. We need everyone to stand up and give an account of the life that they have been given because Jesus Christ is so worthy, so awesome, so amazing, so wonderful. We should bow the knee every day of this year. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.